So there's something called the Pediatric Assessment Trial. This is pushed by the American Academy of Pediatrics, American College of Emergency Physicians. It's I walk in the room and what do I see? I don't have vitals. I haven't heard the history. What does the kid look like? I haven't examined them. What does he, what's he look like? So the first is his appearance. Is he altered? Is he awake? What's his work of breathing from just across the room? Does he look comfortable? Is he breathing too fast, breathing too slow? Does he have retraction? Sometimes you gotta get the nurse to bring the shirt up. Is he belly breathing, working hard, is he sucking in? And what's his circulation from across the room? Is he pale, is he ashen, is he gray? Poor perfusion, just looking across the room. So what do I see from across the room? That's called the pediatric assessment triangle. I don't have vitals, I haven't touched the child yet. Appearance, work of breathing, and their circulation. You get a lot of information just looking at the child. So upper respiratory tract infections. Often parents, every kid has a cold. Until I had my own children, I watched my husband, who's not a, not a physician, he's a chemist, freak out every time they had a cold. I was like, oh, that's why parents come into the hospital. Why are they here for a cold? Often parents will come in when the child have, finally has a cough. Why? Because the parent can't sleep, right? Parents, the kids coughing and coughing and coughing, and they're keeping the parent up, and the parent's got to go to work. We know that, or that's post test of vomiting, right? That's what finally brings them in. Cough, cough, throw up. Isn't it good that adults don't do that? Can you imagine who that just coughed? Can you imagine if post test of coughing, post test of vomiting was a thing in adults? Like, at least three or four people today <laughs> would have vomited while they coughed. Thank God it's not. That medications don't work for cough. In fact, the FDA says, like, we probably shouldn't even prescribe it, right? They banned it for little kids. That snot can actually obstruct a kid's airway. My daughter was like nine months old. I'm off lecturing in Vegas. I think I was actually here in Vegas. And I left my husband with, you know, I knew she had a runny nose. My husband calls, and she's breathing in the 60s. How my husband, as a chemistry professor, knows to clock respirations is beyond me. He must have gone to my lectures. I'm like, well, take her to the hospital. We live down the street from UCLA. And I call, and she's in there like resuscitation room. I'm like, oh, she must be sick. No. Yeah, she was retracting. She was tachypnic when she went in, but all they did was suction her out, and she was breathing fine. That snot can obstruct a kid's airway. They can present with tachypnea, respiratory distress, suction, suction. There's a thing for parents. You put it in your mouth, and you suction your child's snot out. I love my children. I'm not doing that. Sorry. Have the little bulbs suction. That it's, I tell a parent that it's their kid's job to get sick. Your job is to take care of your child. Your job is to go to work. Take care of your family. His job is to get sick. Somebody once told me that by the time you're three, you're supposed to have 30 illnesses. That's one a month. We want to be sick when we're kids. You and I will get wiped out if we get sick, right? Kids bounce back. We need people to be sick when they're little. They build up an immune response. We tell parents it's a virus. It's a chest cold. If you tell someone it's bronchitis, they want antibiotics. You tell them it's a chest cold, they're like, oh, I get it. It's a chest cold. Okay. They don't want antibiotics. That it's okay to cough, that it brings up that nasty stuff. And so a lot of times it's bothering, I watched it with my husband, it's bothering him that she's coughing a lot more than it's bothering the child, right? They're playing with their Legos and I'm like, really, mom? It doesn't look like it's bothering mom that much. The decongestives and anti-cough medicines, first they're banned by the FDA because a handful of kids died. And where you're giving medication that doesn't really work and it's killed a few kids, it's hard to justify keeping it on the market. And so the FDA says don't be giving it to kids less than two. In fact, probably they're up that to eight, 12, because it just doesn't work. And the denial of meds is not linked to patient satisfaction. So just because you didn't write for a cough medicine doesn't mean that education, educating the parent about what's wrong with my kid, what can I do to make my kid feel better, how long is he likely to be sick, what should I bring him back for, that's what parents want. That takes a little longer, but sometimes if they have ears, will have it like pre-printed, it looks like a prescription, and it's got all that stuff down chicken soup, hydrate, and they hand that instead of a prescription for a cough medicine. That honey works better than cough medicines, avoid it in kids less than a year because of the risk of botulism. That young infants, we want to suction them out. And then probiotics, for kids that have a propensity for getting a lot of URIs, probiotics seem to work. Okay, croup. Croup, the modern term for it is to, or the, it's a modern English term, is to cry hoarsely. We've all heard a croupy cough right? They get that barking cough. They get inspiratory strider. There are croup scores out there that you can rate them and you get a croup score. 
and you rate it, my level of ent error entry might be a little different than yours, and my level of retractions, I might score it. So I like to think of it simple. So severe is where the kid's lethargic, cyanotic, that's really rare for a croup. Most of the kids we're gonna see are mild or moderate. A mild kid is croupy cough at triage. There's no strider until I go to examine the kid. Now he's scared, now he's crying, now he has strider. So if you induce the strider when the kid's pissed off, that's mild. If you hear strider at triage, you walk by the triage room, bark, bark, cough, and they have inspiratory strider at rest, just lying there comfortably in mom's arms, that's more of a moderate kid. You don't have to get an x-ray, but this is actually what's going on in there. A normal airway should have more of, a friend of mine talked about a red wine bottle, kind of like looking like shoulders. That's more of a normal airway. And remember, airways are dynamic. So if you take a kid, I don't recommend this, but if you take a normal kid and you take them to the x-ray suite and have them cough and have them swallow and have them talk and you shoot x-rays every four seconds, you're going to see an airway do this. And then occasionally an airway will look like croup because it happens, you happen to catch it in that view. But a kid with real croup, a kid, sorry, a kid with normal airway will occasionally have an airway that looks like croup if you shot a bunch of x-rays. But a kid with croup who's got that inflammation, that viral inflammation, and it's going to be stagnant. And their x-ray is going to look like that. It's that narrowed airway. They call it an inverted pencil, V sign. It looks like more of a white wine bottle or the steeple sign. Cool mist doesn't help. We used to think that, oh, they drive, you know, they come in the middle of the night. It's a cool mist. They come and it's better. No, it doesn't actually help. Is it harmful? No. Respiratory therapies like it. Keeps them at the bedside, give a little kid a blow-by. But it's not really going to help. That steroids are going to help even with mild cases. That prednisone, so prednisone is a short-acting med, decadron is a long-acting med. Why we chose decadron for croup and prednisone for asthma, no one, I mean, it's interchangeable. They're all steroids. Just prednisone is shorter-acting. You got to give longer meds. You got to give more days. So prednisone one day for croup is not enough. Three days works pretty good. But why not just give a dose of decadron? I'm doing that now for asthma. It's one dose, you're done. And we can actually use less. Your typical dose was what, 0.6 per kilo? And now we know that you can even use less, which is less volume to get into the kid, less fighting with the nurse. They're going to love you. 0.15 per kilo. And that you can use inhaled epi. So any kid who's coming in symptomatic is going to deserve, even in mild cases, they're getting steroids. If they're actually uh, having strider at rest, I'm giving them inhaled epinephrine. And the, te the teaching was, oh, you had to admit them because they're going to, you know, the epi will wear off and they'll be sick again. Well, yeah, they, that's true. It's not that they're going to be sicker. It's just the drugs are going to wear off. So watch them for a couple of hours. And you can either use racemic epi, which is the two isomers. We have that in our med room. Or you can pull the L epinephrine that's off the crash cart. There is no difference between racemic epi and L epinephrine, except racemic has the two isomers. We used to think that S second isomer, they are mirror images. If, how, many, how many of you guys are chemistry majors from 1,000 years ago? Yeah, so my husband is a chemist. is like, why did you stupid doctors think both isomers were effective? By law, one of them is inert or doesn't work. They don't both have magical mystical powers. And so for a lot of people, they were trying to push, you know, like the, the uh, monoisomer of albuterol we'll talk about. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. It didn't have less side effects just because you gave the monoisomer. And so same for this, epinephrine. You can pull it off the crash guard, just use the L-epinephrine. Or you can use the racemic epinephrine. This is the original study of Australia. They did the previous 1996 study, 0.15 milligrams per kilo. They're like the only game in town, so they know every, they're the only hospital, so they see everybody. They then in 1995 converted over to, we're just going to give 0.15 forever. They then went back and looked. So they looked at data from 1990 before the switch to after the switch. And they found that the croup visits stayed the same. So the number of kids walking in the door was the same. But after they made the switch, the overall ICU and admission rates didn't change. They actually went down. They didn't go up. Their length of stay declined. There was no significant difference in readmission rates. So they went to the lower dose, and it didn't seem to have any negative effect in regard to outcome. The outcomes were the same, so they could use lower dose. Who gets admitted if they have strider at rest? And that's kind of, you know, depends on the strider. Significant strider despite racemic epi, despite a dose of steroids. Incomplete resolution or response to intervention. Again, they're still they're as symptomatic as they were when they came in. Multiple doses of racemic as it wears off. You give more, it comes off. That's a kid who needs to come in or to an OBS unit. Persistent respiratory distress. Poor social, mom doesn't get it. Kid can't take POs. Those are babies that need to come in. What if you have a kid who looks like croup? 
He's got the strider. He's got the creepy cough. You throw the kitchen sink at him, and he's not any better. He got a couple of doses of racemic. He got a dose of steroids, and he is just not any better. And when you look at him, he's more ill-appearing. Most kids with croup, the cough doesn't look like it's bothering them at all. Even the strider doesn't look like it's bothering him. But this is a kid who looks more ill than your typical croup kid. They're not getting better. And then you notice they actually have kind of a higher fever. Most croup kids have a low-grade fever or no fever. And this kid's got 104. Think bacterial. Every once in a while, these cases will not be a viral tracheal bronchitis, but a bacterial process. And they tend to be the similar head and neck floras, some staph aureus, but more often we'll see things like strep pneumo, H flu, Marxella. These kids need antibiotics. So think about the kid who's more ill appearing, where the typical croup treatment doesn't help, and they have a higher fever than you typically see with croup. Think bacterial. Bronchiolitis. Young babies less than two years of age and a kid who's never wheezed before, tends to be in the winter. RSV tends to be the most common, but there are a lot of other viruses that cause it. Again, it tends to be in the winter. You can just have a snotty nose. It seems to me the kids with RSV have the more snotty nose. And then sometimes it goes to the lower lung fields. So it can just be this or it can be down here. And generally mom will say they've had a cold for a couple of days, but then they bring them in when they see that their work of breathing is they're breathing too fast. Their little chests are going. So again, they can have nasal flaring, grunting. Babies, when they're hypoxic, are, don't look cyanotic. Sometimes they can look pale. So make sure that you get a pulse ox on these babies. This was out of, from 1941, British Medical Journal. This was about the treatment of bronchiolitis. This article is almost 80 years old. They said the treatment was mainly supportive. You fed children, kept them in a warm, moist area, ensured you plenty of oxygen. Little brandy, little whiskey, little port. It's basically the same thing now, 80 years later. We went full circle to do everything to now stand away from the gurney. Right? Except minus the alcohol, I guess. So what are the risk factors for a kid who's not going to do well? A kid who's less than 12 weeks of age, definitely less than 4 to 8 weeks of age, if they're premature, if they, have a, if they have a known heart baby, if they're a known immunocompromised baby, most of our ERs, we're seeing happy, healthy, playful babies. They don't have the significant past medical history to make them high risk. Don't forget about suctioning. Chest x-rays are not mandatory. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck and looks like a duck, it's probably RSV. It's probably bronchiolitis. They don't automatically need a chest x-ray. That inhaled beta agonists and epinephrine should not be routinely used. The American Academy of Pediatrics, you see the reference there, gave recommendations in 2006. It was like for bronchiolitis. Like, yeah, you can try it. It's not probably going to work. You can try it. In 2014, they were like, stand away from the gurney. Don't give them anything. You're making this little kid like throttle him with all these meds, and they're not going to do anything. Supportive care. Little O2. We'll talk about high flow nasal cannula. We talked about this yesterday. Get an x ray. What are you going to see? They're basically hyperinflated hyper because they're air stacking, right? More air is going in than is coming out. And so they air stack. And the best way to see that. You're going to see on the AP view, you're going to see more ribs than typical, maybe nine or ten ribs. It just looks like this is a really big chest. You'll see a little bit of parabronchial cuffing. It's hard to see in this one. But you'll see these little, it's just infl inflammation in the little airways. And then the biggest is on the lateral, where you get this flattening of the diaphragm. That's how the best way to tell air stacking is flattening of the diaphragms. The AP may not really show significant number of ribs. But if you see flattening in the diaphragm and the lateral, that's really what the radiologist is looking for, for our air stacking, for hyperinflation. Again, steroids should not be routinely used. Hypertonic saline may shorten the hospital stay. It doesn't keep people in the ER out of the hospital. It doesn't, may send more people home. But if you're getting in the hospital, it may shorten your stay. The kids where I would say inhaled drugs or steroids may help. If there's a strong family history of atopic disease and asthma, those are kids who are more likely to get better. But, so there's no harm in trying it. It's just stupid when you get see this kid gets admitted to the hospital and they're giving albuterol, 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 albuterol. No effect, no effect, no effect. And yet you're, they're still giving it for two or three days the kid's in-house. Because we feel like we need to do something, right? That the risk for apnea is worse in kid less than a month of age. Again, if they're premature and now born premature and still less than 48 weeks gestationally. If they have a history of cardiac, underlying cardiac or pulmonary disorder, or neuromuscular disorder. Again, most of the kids we're going to see, unless you work at a big tertiary care center, are going to be healthy kids who are going to do really, really well. That the risk for serious bacterial infection is low. You don't also have to look for UTI. They don't, unless there's a well-appearing kid, 
who looks and walks and quacks like a duck and probably bronchiolitis. You don't also have to look for UTI, bacteremia, that you really need to look at their, evaluate their work of breathing and their oxygenation. American Academy of Pediatrics is greater than 90, so 91 and above. I'm kind of a 92, 93 person. That's okay to go home with. I don't like to know what their pulse ox is when they're drinking their bottle or breastfeeding. Don't even tell me. I turn the monitor off. I don't want to know that they go down to the 80s. There's no studies on that. I don't know what to do with that information. So they're satting at 92, I'm good. And then evaluate their height. They have to be able to take POs. This is a full, mom already thought that her six month old child was a full month, full time job. Now the baby has RSV. This baby who used to feed, you know, every few hours, a few times a day is now like, can't they just, they're not wanting to drink. They're just, it's a full time job. And so you gotta tell them Warren bombs. This is gonna be difficult for the next few days. When treating bronchiolitis, refraining from films would delight us. Please av also avoid the neb and the roid. After all, it is only a virus. <laughs> this is about bronchiolitis and CPAP. This is kind of a Mikey liked it. For those of you who know that, what it's serial is it where it's Mikey likes it, right? We tried it on 12 babies and we liked it. This is about the nasal CPAP. It significantly improved their clinical findings. They seem to breathe easier. This is not about a avoiding intubation study. The newer thing, most places, that's the Mikey liked it, right? What cereal is that? This is about, so a lot of places don't have uh, CPAP, but you might have high flow nasal cannula. Um, this is not just about putting the kid on a nasal cannula and turning up the wall oxygen. You will blow out the kid's brains if you do that. It's too drying. You need that humidified, warmed air. So if you have the machine that warms it and heats it up and, and hydrates it, you probably have an RT person that knows how to use it. You'd be surprised. If you're in a NICU, if you have a, you know, a newborn nursery in your hospital, your RTs probably know how to do this upstairs. And so you can use this in the emergency room. And so those are some settings. Babies for less than 10 kilos. You can start them about 2 liters, greater than 10. Start low, increase as needed. We have 78 ERs in Los Angeles. We have an ER on every other corner. And a lot of paramedics, can't, you can't do this in the rig. We, have to, we don't have a, an ICU in our hospital, and our ward doesn't take that many sick kids. So we transfer, and we just turn it off. The tra if the transport time's not that long, just turn it off, put a little, little O2, and the kid can go. But this can be life-saving. This actually can, this avoids a lot of innovation. Contraindication, the kid has to be breathing. So if the kid's altered or not breathing, that's not going to work. It's just like BiPAP wouldn't work. If they have any type of nasal obstruction, because this is nasal airflow. They say less than 30 days is a contraindication, but it's used in the newborn nursery. They will do this in young babies that come that have difficulty breathing when they're first born. Persistent symptoms. This looked at a lot of babies. 95 babies with bronchiolitis. They were mild, moderately sick. Two-thirds of them went home. They did weekly phone calls. Three-quarters of them had RSV. It took, on average, about two weeks for the symptoms to go away. A quarter was still symptomatic at three weeks, and one in 10 were still symptomatic at four weeks. These parents are in for the long haul. If they have a history of eczema or a history of atopic disease, those symptoms seem to be more prolonged. And I average parents miss two days of work. If we could find a panacea for this, like an instant, make the symptoms go away, we'd save a lot of money because we're spending millions, millions of dollars on this, and parents are missing a lot of work. So a little bit on asthma. You have a five-year-old female's history of asthma. He arrives 911 receiving nebulized albuterol. We probably see this a lot, right? He was intubated once. He's had multiple admissions. He's alert. He's tachypnic. He's retracting. He'll attack a cardiac. His O2 sat's not terrible. What are our options? So there are some studies on the mortality risk, that kid walking in the door. If he has a history of previous intubations, if there's two or more hospitalizations, multiple ER visits, or even in the last month, that raises that risk for that child to ha not have a good outcome. So those are kind of, the, kind of the basics that we want to get out of mom. If they're on chronic steroids, in my population, I have a lot of kids that are just lost to follow up and they probably should be on systemic steroids. So sometimes that question is a false negative. Severity of symptoms, mild, moderate, severe. That's less probably important in the emergency room. We're also going by, it, you know, is, is this able, the child able to communicate? Is he tripoding? Is he not able to get, can he can only say one word at a time. We know what a tight asthmatic looks like. It's very similar in the young children that have that, that come in very, very tight. 
that panicked look, that tachypnea, that work of breathing. I always keep them with mom. Keep them in mom's arms. Keep mom at the bedside. The last thing you need to do is agitate them by taking mom out of the room. MDIs are as efficacious as nebulizers. So you can use a nebulizer or you can just keep pumping the MDI. It's probably easier for the RT to just set up the nebulizer and walk away. But know that if you don't have nebulizers, you can just keep using the MDI with a spacer that's going to put more lung drug in the child's lungs. One study looked at using what they called was half an MDI puff per kilo. Obviously, round up to a, it's hard to give half a puff, so round it up to a full puff with a maximum of 10 puffs. That's the same as giving 2.5. The continuous beta agonist back to back, whether you get, the key with this is not, you want to give a dose, and this is true with adults, you want to give a dose of albuterol, you don't want to walk away for two hours. They need some back to back treatments when they come in that tight. Or you can just set up more in the little canister and do it continuously. Those work the same. That we talked about that mono isomer, so leave albuterol is the single isomer as opposed to what we typically have in our ERs is racemic. It's regular albuterol, it has both isomers. And people thought for a while, oh, I'm gonna get leave albuterol. I'm gonna take out that nasty other isomer and there'll be less jitteriness, there'll be less side effects. It never panned out and it's more expensive. So most hospitals have not switched over to the single isomer. They're just still doing the traditional cheap albuterol. And that sleeping kids actually their work of breathing, because they're relaxed, is actually better. They're, they've improved their tidal volume. They, you'll see a lot of the wheezing and the tightness when the kid finally falls asleep. The parents will often say, yeah, he, his breathing seems to be much improved, much more relaxed, much deeper to lung volumes. Anticholinergics, if a kid's coming in, and a lot of times they're doing this, it's, the teaching is kind of one drug more than then came in with. So if they're already doing albuterol, or even if they're not, al anticholinergics work. That it can be given as multi-dose. We used to say just give it as one dose in their ER visit. They actually can get several doses in the emergency room. And t you can dose ipotropium per kilo, but typically we'll just use a quarter for a smaller kid and a half a milligram for a larger kid. Same as albuterol. You can dose it per kilo, but just use two and a half milligrams for a smaller child and five milligrams for a larger child. That steroids work you can give prednisone or methylprednisolone. You'd promise you need to do it for several days. One dose like dec Decadron is not going to work. Three days, five days. You got to mix it up with something that tastes good, cherry syrup, concentrated Kool-Aid. Don't put the normal amount of water in with the Kool-Aid. Make it kind of into a slurry chocolate syrup. You can crush the pill. Oral Pred is a grape flavored one that can be, it's a commercial one. Decamethasone, there's no reason why you can't use Decadron. Most of the studies are two dosages, if you look at them. At least one, the dose you gave in the department is probably adequate because the half-life is long. Prednisolone tastes a little bit better and Decadron tastes a little better. Prednisone tastes pretty nasty. That steroids should be given early in the course. Don't wait to see if this kid gets better with just your albuterol and your atrovin. Give them a dose of steroids early. And if they can't take POs at all, they're vomiting. You can either give it IV or you can actually give inhaled too. It works any way you give it. Inhaled, up the nose, up the butt, I, it doesn't really matter how you give it. It works the same. The IV sub-Q IM beta agonists, they, they tend to be, we tend to hold them on to the sicker patient, but no, they're not the panacea. We're at this point throwing the, just like in adults, we throw the kitchen sink because we don't want to innovate. We know that innovating asthmatics, is, there's peril with that. And so we like to avoid it. And so we'll look for something like IV or IM beta agonists. And most of the studies say it's safe. It's, you know, probably not any better than actually going inhaled, inhaled, inhaled. But we get to that knee jerk, I don't want to innovate, I'm going to do more. Magnesium tends to be safe for life threatening. It inhibits the smooth muscle contraction, decreases cholinergic stimulation, and has some effects. But it's probably best saved for your very, that tends to be the studies out there, is they save it for the very, very kind of life-threatening situations. Heliox is a drug looking for a patient. Doesn't help an asthma. Aminophilin, I can't remember the last time I got asked when I tried to admit an asthmatic, did you give aminophilin? That has really died. It didn't work and they make kids vomit. So now I have a vomiting, I can't breathe child. So I'd like to lie, yeah, yeah, I gave the aminophilin. Uh-huh, yeah, it didn't help. Because you didn't want to give it. So thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs down. 
And then all this other stuff, methods, all this stuff we used to do, it's just not helpful. So thumbs down. We used to physical therapy and the mucolid, all that stuff has been shown to be like not really helpful. So we talked about positive pressure of innovation, CPAP, things like that. It's, it's in the pediatric world, we just, it's not as much as it is in the adult population where they're seeing research, but it works. The studies are small, but they seem to show consistent results, that it decreases innovation rate and mortality, but you gotta have the equipment. So if you're in a busy pediatric place, make sure you at least have something like high flow nasal cannulas. That can be used for asthma too. Make sure you have the right equipment. Again, it's not just cranking the wall oxygen up. You gotta have that little blender. Get your RD, maybe spry, you're probably already being used in your hospital, you have no idea. But you need to and, you know, talk to your RT people before the winter comes. They may, not, they may wanna buy a couple of more kits, a couple of more devices. Because you're saying, look, I routinely wanna do this now in my emergency room for those little babies that come in with asthma or the bad asthmatic. There's something called delayed sequence innovation. So this is that asthmatic kid, he's fighting, you're throwing the kitchen sink at him, you're like, I'm gonna have to tube this kid. And this is true, you can use this for a kind of those other situations where the patient is just fighting you because a lot of times it's hypoxia and they're not thinking clearly and they're fighting and they're fighting. So you give a dose of ketamine and it gets them in that lights are on, no one's home stage. You can then pre-oxygenate while you're still throwing the kid, they're still getting nibs and all that stuff, but you can pre-oxygenate them. They're not fighting with a mask. And then you can go ahead and innovate them if you need to. A lot of times just giving a few minutes of ketamine, now the drugs are finally kicking in and you're seeing their work of breathing is improving and their two sets are coming up and the wheezing is, you know, is going away and their, their air movement is better. Sometimes they just needed the drug to kick in and they avoid innovation. But this is a way, it's called delay, rather than rapid sequence drug, 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 innovate, this is give the sedation med and then sit on them for a minute and let them pre-oxygenate and then finish the rest of your sequence innovation. There's been a few case reports about this and in the adult population too. It's called delayed sequence innovation. Kind of a Mikey liked it. We tried it and we liked it. Who can go home, be wary of bounce backs? Remember that the initial treatment the response to that initial treatment, they come in, he's wheezing and wheezing, he's tripoding. I throw the kid, he gets nebs, he gets steroids, he gets anticholinergic. His initial response to that treatment is probably the best predictor of whether or not he's gonna go home, depending, versus just how sick is he when he presented. That initial response is more likely to predict, is this child gonna be able to go home? The reassessment at one hour can be that predictor of who needs to be admitted. If they're still severe, at an hour, most of them are gonna to have to come in. They're, you know, the longer they've been sick, the more likely it are they're probably gonna be admitted because it takes that long to turn them around. If they're still moderately sick at an hour, their work of breathing is less, but they're still working, they still can't say full sentences, they're still retracting, they're probably coming in. And ask the parent, they've dealt with this asthma more than you have. A mom who's been dealing with a 10-year-old since the kid was little, a toddler with asthma and has had multiple ER visits, she's gonna know this better than you. So engage them, is this one you're coming in for, mom? Look at their work of breathing, pulse ox greater than 90. If you do peak flows, I haven't done peak flows in ages. For me, it's more their clinical. Is their work of breathing improved? Are they able to take POs? Can they speak in full sentences? What's their oxygenation at rest? I don't need a peak flow. Are they able to take POs and what's the home situation? Can mom really stay on top of this kid? So a few take home points, consider low dose. If you're using DEX for mild to moderate croup, which I think we all are, consider you lowering the dose. You don't need 0.6 anymore, you can do 0.15. Be aggressive about albuterol and atrovent. You can give the atrovent with every dose of the albuterol. Consider Decadron for asthma. There's no reason why that mom has to fight with the kid for three or five days with prednisone that routine beta agonists or steroids for bronchiolitis are not gonna be helpful. Yeah, in the kid with atopic disease with eczema, it's probably gonna be more efficacious. There's no harm trying it, but to continue giving it, when you saw no response, 25 years ago, my attending said, you know it's RSV when the albuterol doesn't work. And that's still the same today. And learn about high flow nasal cannula. Talk to your RT, you'd be surprised that in your hospital, maybe when your sister's hospital, they're doing this. You just need to have the equipment. And that's it. Thank you very much.